This video will discuss the use of the beer block or intravenous regional anesthesia in the management of an extremity injury. Please note, beer is spelled B-I-E-R, not B-E-E-R. Anesthesia produced by B-E-E-R blocks are found elsewhere on the YouTube site, although they probably involve the same patient seen in these videos and probably most of the ED personnel as well. To perform the beer block, a solution of half percent lidocaine is generally employed. To prepare this solution, 1% lidocaine is mixed with equal parts of normal saline. It is important to use lidocaine without epinephrine for this preparation. Marcaine may also be used to perform the beer block. Generally, the solution that is employed is a 1% solution, which is 10 mg per ml of lidocaine, is mixed with equal parts of normal saline. The normal saline is generally obtained from either an intravenous bag or the intravenous flushes that are used uh, for saline locks can be employed as well. They're generally a little bit more convenient and easier to get your hands on. It's important to mix up enough of the solution. Uh, generally for an upper extremity block, it's anywhere between 25 to 50 cc's and for a lower extremity block, at least 50 cc's is employed of the half percent solution. Some people will inject a smaller amount, half the amount of 1% lidocaine and then follow it with a equal amount of saline as an injection. This technique can be used, although it is probably preferable to mix up the half percent solution and use that to perform the beer block. If you are performing the block on a child, the maximum dose of lidocaine to be used is 4.5 milligrams per kilogram, and the maximum amount of marcaine or bupivacaine that can be used is 2.5 milligrams per kilogram. Once the solution is prepared, an intravenous catheter is placed in the affected arm. It can be placed above or below the injury, it really doesn't matter. It's generally a good idea to raise a little wheel of lidocaine prior to the placement of the intravenous catheter itself. The catheter is inserted like any other intravenous catheter and converted to a saline lock with an access port on the end of it. At this point, it can just be taped into place until you're ready to inject the lidocaine solution. At this point, arterial tourniquets can be placed to isolate the arm and the affected area once the lidocaine is injected intravenously. It is extremely important that the area of the arm in which the lidocaine will be injected can be completely isolated from the rest of the circulation. Because of the large number of milligrams of lidocaine or bupivacaine that are to be administered, it is important that it does not enter the systemic circulation directly. To help prevent this problem, two tourniquets are placed on the patient. Both of them are taped in place and both of them must be arterial. Now there are commercial systems available which have double tourniquets built into them, but in the emergency department, generally two separate tourniquets are placed on the patient. It's a good idea to actually tape the blood pressure cuffs in place. This prevents accidental unwinding of the cuff while the lidocaine is being administered intravenously. The pressure in the cuff is inflated until it is at least 50 millimeters above the patient's systolic blood pressure. Most people will probably take it up to almost 300 to be sure that they are well above the patient's systolic blood pressure. Once the cuff is inflated, the tubing itself is actually clamped. This is because most blood pressure cuffs will leak unless they are firmly clamped into place. So neither the bulb valve nor the actual manometer itself can be relied on to hold the pressure that needed for these patients. Some people will wrap the arm with web roll and put the blood pressure cuff on top of that to make it a little bit more comfortable for the patient. The arm is exsanguinated by wrapping it with a tight elastic dressing as well as elevating the arm to get as much blood out of it as possible. Once this is done, the blood pressure cuffs are inflated to well above the patient's systolic blood pressure. As you can see, the actual manometer is going around once and beyond on this patient. And the tubing is clamped. Again, it is imperative to make sure that the tubing is clamped on these patients. Once that's done, the manometer itself can actually be disconnected from the patient. Once the arm's exsanguinated and the blood pressure cuffs are elevated, the wrapping is removed. 
Lack of a pulse is documented through use of a pulse ox, which shows no waveform. At this point, the lidocaine solution can be injected into the arm. As the solution is being injected, you can see the veins in the patient actually distend because there's no place for the lidocaine to go other than in those veins with both the arterial tourniquets in place. You also notice how gray and dusky the patient's hands look. After a few minutes, the lidocaine will take effect. It can take up to 10 to 15 minutes to get a really good block in place. But once the lidocaine has taken effect, you can do your reduction or repair your laceration or debride your burn, whatever you need to do to the arm and the patient will generally have no pain at all. Okay. Sorry. As you can see in here, this patient is perfectly comfortable as we manipulate his fracture. Uh, he, I assure you he is completely awake and he has not received any sedatives on top of this. This is strictly the beer block that's producing all his anesthesia. You can see a small little laceration on the bottom of his wrist, but this is not an open fracture. And we can manipulate this pretty freely without any difficulty on this patient because his entire arm from that distal tourniquet down is completely numb. After at least 20 minutes and preferably a little bit longer of isolation of the lower extremity through the use of the arterial tourniquets, the tourniquets can be deflated and removed. It's generally best to slowly deflate uh, the tourniquets to allow the blood flow to ease into the hand rather than rush back into it. At this point, the intravenous catheter is removed and a sugar tongue splint is placed on the patient following the reduction. The patient's arm will remain anesthetized for up to an hour or longer with the lidocaine and for up to six hours if bupivacaine is used. The key points in the use of a beer block are, number one, to make sure that you use the double arterial tourniquets and that they remain in place for up to 20 minutes after the lidocaine or the bupivacaine is injected. This allows the drug to be fixed in the tissue so there is no bolus into the systemic circulation, which can result in seizures or other complications from lidocaine toxicity. The other thing to consider on use of the beer block or intravenous regional anesthesia is that it's probably underutilized. Patients with multiple lacerations to their extremity from glass injuries, those with burns, extensive burns that need debridement, and those with fractures that are just difficult to, to manage with procedural sedation all should be considered candidates for the use of this technique. Okay. You're good.